Hi, this is Dr. Justin Esri, and this is week 10 of PolySci 509, the linear model. And uh, this week we're going to talk about hierarchical linear modeling, uh, which is um, a continuation of a topic we started last week, how to deal with panel or time series cross-section data. Uh, hierarchical linear modeling is uh, one approach for dealing with um, a problem that exists in uh, TSCS data, uh, unit heterogeneity. So uh, as you remember, unit heterogeneity, um, as, uh, the form of unit heterogeneity we discussed last week is a case where um, each unit, so like every country or every state or maybe every person if you're observing uh, one person over multiple time periods, um, has a different um, base uh, average of the dependent variable or, or some kind of um, a differential intercept. That's, that's the form of unit heterogeneity we discussed uh, last week. Um, so this is a case where you've got you know some kind of x variable, some kind of y variable, um, and you're looking at different people, um, and those people have the same slope. Each unit has the same relationship between y and x, uh, but their intercepts are quite different, which is just a way of saying, oh, that last one wasn't so good, which is just a way of saying uh, that their average rates of y, their y bars or something, um, are, are different um, due to unobserved characteristics of each unit. That's one form of unit heterogeneity, but it's not the only form. Uh, some forms of unit heterogeneity are, are much more complex uh, than, than this one. And uh, hierarchical linear models are a way of dealing with some of the more complicated versions of unit heterogeneity uh, that can exist in panel data. Um, as we're going to discuss, HLM is a form of random effects model, which means that uh, it's not uh, necessarily suitable for dealing with every conceivable kind of problem that you can encounter in TSCS data. Uh, it's useful for a wide variety of these problems, but, but not all. And so what I want to start off with this week is a little bit of a review of um, some of the simpler ver uh, versions of unit heterogeneity that can exist in uh, time series cross-section data. Um, and the key thing or the key characteristic that separates when a random effects model is appropriate versus a fixed effects model. And then we're going to use that to lead into a discussion of, okay, given that knowledge and given that we know that HLM is a form of random effects model, when is HLM uh, a tool that we might want to use uh, to address uh, some problem that we perceive may exist in TSCS data? So with uh, that little bit of a, a, a preview in mind, let's get started. So as we discussed last week, unit heterogeneity can have different consequences. Um, unit heterogeneity in the sense of um, each unit in a panel or time series cross-section data set having a different intercept is, so we're going to start off with that basic form of, of unit heterogeneity. Uh, neglecting that form of unit heterogeneity by not just sort of not modeling it at all is equivalent to a form of omitted variable bias. Um, in essence, we're saying each one of our panels has some kind of different mean or y-intercept associated with it. We're just going to treat them all as if they have the same mean and, and estimate accordingly. Um, as we discussed last week, that can lead to bias. Uh, the bias problem occurs uh, when x, the regressor of interest, and the unit effects, alpha, as we denoted last week, are correlated. And it's uh, easy to um, depict that. So uh, here's a little graph where we've got x and then some kind of y here. And uh, let's suppose that here we've got unit A, here we've got unit B, uh, let's see, here we've got unit C, and here we've got unit D. So these are four different units. And you can see just by looking that if we were to uh, model the fact that each one of these units has a different intercept, we would draw four linear least squares regression lines, oh, don't need the red, uh, like so, each of them having the same slope, uh, but having a different y-intercept. So you can see uh, get a neutral color here. Here are the four y intercepts, one, two, three, and this guy would have a y intercept way down here, four. Um, but if you just let uh, OLS regression um, run with this data in a pooled fashion without telling it that these were f data from four different units, 
it might be inclined to draw the following line, something like that. Actually, it's not a very good one. Maybe something like that. In other words, if you didn't tell OLS that these were four different um, panels um, and that each one had a different intercept, it's probably going to fit a least squares line um, that not only is, is not a good match for the underlying DGP, but actually goes in the opposite direction. And you can see why this happened. Uh, the red unit, for example, has the highest y-intercept and the lowest value of x. Right? It tends to its its units tend to be concentrated. Its observations tend to be concentrated at low values of x. Um, whereas the black units, there, here we go, tend to be concentrated at high units of x, and they have the lowest y-intercept. And the same goes for green and blue. They're kind of both in the middle. Um, in other words. X and alpha are correlated. Alpha red here, alpha 1, is uh, really high and its X's are low. Um, alpha 2, the green one here, is a little bit lower and the X's are a little bit higher, and so on. So this is where this is a case where you get bias. But that's not the only thing that can happen. Uh, there are also cases where um, X and, a are, X and alpha are not correlated, and here we just get an efficiency problem. X and alpha not correlated. So if I were to draw uh, this situation, I'm just going to put the same X and Y in here. Here's X, here's Y. Uh, actually, yeah, that's fine. And um, now I'm going to draw my units in such a way that, okay, they all have the same slope. They all have different intercepts, but their x values are basically the same. Like so. Now, if you can imagine trying to draw a single OLS line through this entire cloud, it's quite likely going to go in uh, in the right direction. It's going to go something like, you know, like that. But our standard errors are going to be too large. The reason our standard errors are going to be too large is uh, without telling st uh, the statistical package that these four um, groups of observations come from four different panels, it's just going to treat all the errors the same. It's going to, you know, this is a U, and that's a U, and that's a U, and that's a U, and so on. So it's going to overestimate um, it's the, the you have, the error component. Whereas if you tell it, no, 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 actually what we have here is really four lines, right? Each one with a distinct intercept. Then it knows, ah, the errors I should really be looking for are these relatively tiny gaps between the individual panel line and the observation line and the, and the, pan, the unit specific uh, regression line. So in other words, you allow the statistical package to partition the error into two components. One, the between so this is like uh, the difference between units. So like, let me give you an example. Here's another line here with its own y-intercept. And there's some one explanation for the difference between the blue and the red observations is this. This is like the between units variance. And then there's uh, components of the error that's really about movement inside of a panel. So that's like these little guys, these little observations. And that's the within unit error. So you allow the statistical program to differentiate between unit error from within unit error and thus you in effect explain away the between unit error um, which allows you to get a sense that ah I'm actually estimating this slope much more accurately than pooling the data might lead me to believe. So uh, this is a case where we don't have bias problems but we do have efficiency problems. Uh, as you may remember Fixed effects models are designed to uh, match up or correct for this kind of situation where bias is an issue. Uh, whereas random effects models are really more designed for this situation where efficiency is the main problem. So the reason for this is, as you may remember, random effects models assume as a part of their, their uh, modeling structure that the unit level variances or the unit level um, the unit explanatory variables the unit components of the variance or the between effects 
are randomly distributed according to some distribution, usually the normal, with a mean and a variance. Uh, and typically, for a random effects model, alpha bar is zero. So in other words, the random effects are assumed to be mean zero once you account for the, the, the intercept, the y-intercept, the grand y-intercept. Um, thus, in effect, what you have to say is the unit effects are uncorrelated with x and independently and identically distributed. Um, and that's the, that's the only source of between effects. Um, when that's true, it's great. You get efficiency gains. When it's not true, you're going to get some bias. Um, fixed effects models are, are possibly going to be more appropriate because um, you're going to put in a lot of parameters and those parameters are going to explicitly model the intercepts and you're going to sort of capture any, you're going to eliminate any omitted variable bias that, that might exist in your, in your data set. Um, hierarchical linear models are a, a form of random effects model. And so everything I'm going to say um, about hierarchical linear models is going to assume that whatever random effects we have are uncorrelated with the regressors x. So that might be leading you to ask, well, if that's true, and if random effects models are always biased whenever the random effects, whenever the unit heterogeneity is correlated with x, when can I use these things, or why would I ever want to use these things? Well, we'll return to that issue um, at the end um, because there is sort of a question of, well, given that random effects are biased from time to time, when and when when is it okay, when is it not okay uh, uh, to use them? So for now, just have in mind that HLM is a random effects model, and part of the assumption of a random effects model is that there's no correlation between X and the unit effects. We'll proceed from there, and then at the very end, we'll revisit the issue of, well, when is it okay for me to to make this assumption, even if it's yeah, not exactly true. So setting aside for a moment the issue of um, random effects versus fixed effects, which is to say is bias or um, variance the biggest issue to tackle here, um, there's another issue to think about, which is unit heterogeneity doesn't just come in the form of varying slopes. It also comes in the form of varying intercepts. That is to say, the relationship between x and y can be different in different units. So uh, for example, uh, just illustrating with a simple graph, I'm going to use my graph tool here and just make three simple graphs. One, two, and three. And we're going to say that uh, each of these graphs shows the relationship between uh, GDP growth and political stability. And uh, there are three countries we're looking at, Congo, France, and the United States. Now, uh, the varying intercepts case says, OK, um, unit heterogeneity works out to being the same relationship in all three states, but with different intercepts. So the state with the lowest stability is the Congo for various reasons. Um, but increases in its GDP growth would contribute to its stability. The US, on the other hand, starts at uh, a sort of a middling baseline of stability. Actually, what do we say? The US, France, and so France might be a little lower, actually. They, they ride a lot. So let's say that uh, the US is actually the most, the most state, politically stable country. Um, GDP growth increases its stability, but it starts from a lower baseline. And just in this example, we'll say that France is somewhere in between. That's a varying intercepts model. So we'll call this a varying intercepts model. But there's also such a thing as a varying slopes model. Um, we could, for example, say, OK, all three of these countries start at the same base, but each has a different intercept where some, can some countries can benefit more from increases in GDP growth than others. So we might say, well, the Congo is a country that would benefit the most from increases in GDP growth. So we still have political stability on the y-axis, GDP growth on the x-axis. Uh, France is somewhere in the middle. And the United States is a place where uh, GDP growth is not going to contribute much to stability in, at the margins. But this model assumes that if GDP growth were, say, suppose this is the intercept here is zero, were zero 
for all three of these countries, their stability levels would be the same. That's a varying slopes model. So right in here, varying slopes. And I'm sure you can guess what the third one's going to be. Uh, it's possible that we can have varying slopes and varying intercepts at the same time. So for example, we might say, uh, look, the Congo starts from a very low base of, of growth, uh, or I'm sorry, of, uh, of stability, um, and can really benefit from GDP growth because most of its instability, one might suppose, might be uh, because of their uh, low GDP performance. Actually, more accurately, perhaps their, um, their, this, their state of the world, given their political and geographic situation, is such that GDP growth will help them disproportionately. I guess that's probably a better way to say it. Uh, the U.S. Um, starts from a pretty high level of stability, and growth doesn't change it very much. Um, it gets a little better or a little worse, um, but doesn't really change much. And then France is somewhere in between. They start from a fairly high level of stability, uh, much like the U.S., uh, but are more sensitive to um, growth rates in their political stability than the U.S. is. So this is a varying intercepts and varying slopes model. Uh, varying intercepts and slopes. Uh, so going back up to the, uh, this little equation here where I've got these models written out, um, we can write this as uh, y, the dependent variable, is a function of the unit effect intercept and also a unit specific um, slope term. So the intercepts are distributed randomly according to some mean and some standard deviation but so are the betas. Uh, and so alpha is the uh, mean intercept, and beta is the mean slope. Uh, and the idea is we've got some kind of grand alpha here, and there's a distribution around that that gives you the unit effects. There's also, at the same time, a grand beta right here, and there's some distribution around that that um, represents unit heterogeneity. So as you can immediately guess from the way we've written these things out, this is a random effects model. Um, we are assuming that the effects are distributed according to typically a normal distribution or, or something like it. Um, that doesn't mean that the effects necessarily have to be independently and identically distributed, however. Uh, we could, for example, write out the following model. We could say, all right, uh, let's suppose that y is alpha i plus x beta i uh, plus an error term. Uh, and we're going to assume that um, alpha i and beta i as a block vector here are distributed according to the multivariate normal with stacked means alpha and beta and a VCV matrix sigma. Uh, so what we're saying here is basically that the alphas and betas um, might be sort of linked in how they're distributed. A big alpha value, so a big draw for alpha, might also be associated with a big draw for beta, or a small draw for beta. Um, they're still randomly distributed, and they still have means equal to the grand means alpha and beta, so we're still in a random effects environment. However, it, it, can, it can be accommodated. The idea that the slopes and intercepts within units are correlated can be accommodated via such a model. So we might say, for example, that um, if you start from a low, an especially low, going back to this example here, if you start from an especially low base of stability, so a low alpha, you might be especially sensitive to growth in increasing your stability, which would be a big beta. So alpha and beta in that case would be negatively correlated. The draws of alpha i and beta i would be negatively correlated in that, in that instance. Um, a hierarchical model is basically a way of recognizing this sort of correlation among the effects, um, and sort of even more to the point, even more complicated uh, versions of correlation among the effects, in particular hierarchical or nested correlations among the effects. So now I'm going to um, introduce hierarchical linear models, how they relate to this correlation among effects, and how they allow us to simultaneously model varying intercepts and varying slopes. So a hierarchical linear model is just a random effects model with multiple correlated random effects where the correlation in those effects kind of takes a, a special form. 
Um, so let me just give you an example. Um, suppose we've got uh, data from the American states. So this is like you know, 50 US states. And we've got time series cross-sectional data on, on these. Um, <clears throat> we might think of there being two kinds of unit heterogeneity. Regional unit heterogeneity and state level regional uh, state level unit heterogeneity. So, for example, all the southern states, all the midwestern states, etc., um, sort of bear similarities to each other. Um, and within those regions, the states, like for example, inside the South, Georgia, um, Alabama, and so on, inside the Midwest, uh, Ohio. Yes, I know some of you think that Ohio is not in the Midwest. It is. Um, Iowa, maybe Indiana, something like that. Um, these states differ from each other but share commonalities uh, among the Midwest. So um, the model kind of looks like this. We've got some dependent variable and it's distributed according to um, alpha i plus x beta plus epsilon. Um, but uh, alpha i uh, is the distribution of unit effects. So this is the distribution of unit effects. It's, say, normal here. I'm going to draw the phi. Uh, it's got a common regional mean and some kind of variation, um, sigma alpha squared. Um, so this is the regional mean. And all of the states in the same region are going to get unit effects alpha i that share some common regional mean. Then that regional mean, in turn, mu r, is distributed according to cap phi uh, with mean 0 and standard deviation sigma r squared. So here we've got the distribution of regional effects, I'm sorry, of unit effects, with a common regional mean. And here we've got the distribution of regional means. And I've written this as having a common regional mean of 0. Um, we could easily also say that there's just some common intercept mu, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I, I mean, it matters in a particular data set, but not for the overall setup. Um, so this is you know, a, a hierarchical model. And you can tell it's hierarchical because the random effects are kind of nested inside one another as trees. Uh, as a tree. So the first level of the tree has you know, regional effects. So like you know, the first thing we do is decide, oh, you're in the Midwest or you're in the South or maybe um, you're in the Mountain West or maybe you're in the Coastal Pacific region, something like that. And then inside of each region there are unit effects that are distributed somehow. And so in, in essence what we're talking about here is a systematic clustering of um, unit effects. Uh, and in hierarchical models, the hierarchy comes from the fact that these are nested inside one another. So drawing this tree as a sort of distribution, as a probability distribution, here's uh, the distribution of regional means. It's got some kind of common regional mean here. There's our f of regional means. And then, so every state it, or I'm sorry, every group of states in a particular region gets a particular draw from this distribution of regional means. So this is regional mean 1, regional mean 2, regional mean 3. Oops, oh, screwed that up. Regional mean 3. And this forms the basis of the distribution for alpha i. So just dotting this so that it doesn't interfere. There we go. There are the three regional means. Then we draw alpha out of three distributions with three common regional means. So like uh, Texas is in the, um, well, it depends on where you count, I guess, usually it's grouped in with the south. So let's say this is the southern distribution right here. Texas might be here. Uh, Georgia might be over here. But it's definitely systematically different from the group of states in the Midwest. So like Wisconsin might be here. Ohio might be here. Uh, Iowa might be here, and so on. So that's what a, a hierarchical model looks like. 
Uh, not all mixed effects models uh, are hierarchical models. So a mixed effects model is just one where there are multiple random effects going on at the same time. Uh, and not all random effects models of this kind need necessarily be hierarchical. So uh, for example, suppose we've got a model where y is alpha i plus uh, gamma i plus x beta plus epsilon, uh, where alpha i is distributed normally with some kind of root mean and sigma squared alpha, and gamma, whoops, that's not a gamma, uh, gamma i is also distributed with some completely different group mean, geez, I keep drawing mu's, with some uh, completely different group mean, some particularly completely different standard deviation. Um, we might, for example, say, hey, look, there are um, random effects having to do with someone's region, you know, where they live. So this is like if we have people here, this is supposed as a model of people. We might say, hey, look, uh, there's some kind of random effect by, uh, by region, but there's also some kind of random effect by age cohort. And we wouldn't necessarily expect the region and age cohort um, effects. First of all, they're certainly not nested. Uh, being uh, Midwestern doesn't necessarily automatically put you into a different age cohort than a Southerner or a Westerner. Um, nevertheless, we might expect, oh, there are there is this unit heterogeneity um, that exists by region or by age cohort or whatever. And um, we're going to model those things as mean zero effects or common mean effects that are randomly distributed, sort of nuisance effects. Um, but they're not necessarily uh, wrapped uh, in another. A very common thing, this maybe is not the best thing because we probably, if we wanted to model age, we'd probably just put that in as a, as a covariate. But one thing that would be very common is suppose we have country effects and year effects. So different years have different patterns of warfare, GDP growth, all sorts of things associated with them. Different countries are also systematically different on these measures, but we don't expect any kind of nesting between them. So that is an example of a, of a mixed effects model uh, that's, that's not at all um, hierarchical. Uh, we can actually handle both hierarchical and non-hierarchical type mixed effects models in the software package that I'm going to, to show you in just a few minutes. So um, what happens when we ignore uh, the hierarchical structure of a data set and simply <coughs> pool the, the data as though it had no hierarchical structure? Well, the answer to this question is, is somewhat complicated and one that we're going to discuss um, when we uh, think about what what, uh, what happens when we estimate a hierarchical linear model on uh, data where x and the uh, random effects are correlated. Um, but in general, just going with the previous answer of assuming that um, random effects is the right model and so there is no correlation between x and the unit heterogeneity, uh, if that's true, the consequence of ignoring the hierarchical structure of data is primarily um, efficiency loss, which is to say um, we are getting standard errors that are bigger than they could be um, if we were to account for that hierarchical structure. So estimating a hierarchical mixed effects uh, model uh, gets us a narrower SEs, standard errors, uh, on our beta coefficient estimates uh, than we could achieve by simply um, ignoring the hierarchy and pooling all the data from all the units into a giant estimator. Um, now, uh, one thing that, that might be uh, interesting to note is um, fixed effect doesn't mean the same thing in the hierarchical linear model context. Um, so uh, the fixed effects in this case, whoops, spelled that wrong. Uh, the fixed effects are the um, characteristics of a model that are just not random. That is to say, they're fixed, uh, which, which does make sense, um, but it means something different than a fixed effects model. Uh, you might think a fixed effects model might mean because uh, we're we're not we're no longer talking about um, dummy variables. Uh, we're talking about 
the um, betas on the x components. So for example, when we write out a model like the one we, we wrote out previously, where y uh, is a function of um, some kind of um, random effect plus um, some coefficients you know, in an error term, um, what we mean when we say fixed effect in the hierarchical linear model context is this. That's the fixed effect. Uh, the random effect is this bit here. Um, if we were to allow um, the slopes to vary, so just give us some, give ourselves some more space here. If we were to allow the uh, slopes to vary, so we wrote out the model um, y is a function of some um, random intercepts and also some random slopes. Now we have two sets of random effects. We've got this and this, uh, and the only fixed components are the uh, perhaps the estimated means, so the mean of the beta distribution. Oops. And alpha takes a distribution as well. We might be estimating these constant uh, things as fixed effects, but the actual distri the the uh, the the um, uh, bits that are the bits that are um, different across units are assumed to be randomly distributed, and hence are are so-called random effects. Uh, in other words, all hierarchical linear models are uh, random effects models in the sense that. They, um, uh, when they estimate unit heterogeneity, they assume that it takes a random effects uh, framework. Um, the fixed effect does not mean dummy variable, least squares dummy variables, or some kind of dummy variable um, handling of unit heterogeneity because um, hierarchical linear models typically don't take that approach at all. They don't do dummy variables. Um, the, the second uh, thing that um, you get out of a hierarchical linear model uh, is um, by not estimating an HLM, you neglect interesting structural aspects of the data generating process. So if, for example, we think that data takes this form where we've got you know, random effects that are nested, um, where you know, there's a sort of region and then a state level um, nesting, or maybe you know, some kind of uh, world region, and then a country level nesting. Um, it just it, we learn things by um, estimating random effects um, that assumes this structure. For example, as we'll see when we go to the software component here, where we start estimating these models in R, um, you'll get estimates of um, each country's unit effect and each region's unit effect. Um, if the slopes vary from place to place, we'll get estimates of how the slopes are different um, between these different areas or these different units and these different regions. Um, so we can actually learn things about how um, different kinds of um, units are different from each other, both in their intercepts and in their slopes. And um, this is not a main point of, um, of the lecture, but this is the basis for um, multi-level regression, uh, multi uh, regression with post-stratification. Um, the idea being that if you estimate a multi-level model, like the ones we've described, these hierarchical models, um, that have varying slopes and varying intercepts, and then um, perform the estimation and then recover how each um, unit is different, both in its slopes and its intercepts, after the post-estimation, right, multiple, multiple, multiple regression or multi-level modeling or regression with post-stratification. If you recover that information post-estimation, you can then get um, information on how these um, units are different from each other and plot that information and learn something about the, heterogene the unit heterogeneity in your data. Um, and that unit heterogeneity can, in and of itself, be theoretically interesting. Um, we'll do that in some live data uh, in, in R today. We'll do so, a little bit of post-stratification where we um, run a multi-level model and then uh, on, on American state data, actually, and then see how, um, how hetero how, what the structure of that heterogeneity looks like state by state. 
So that, that can be pretty interesting. And if, if you don't estimate it, uh, if you don't estimate a multi-level model, you're going to miss out on all of that heterogeneity. Now, of course, it's worth saying that in order to get these uh, results, in order to get estimates of alpha i or beta i um, differing from region to region or unit to unit, um, we have to make assumptions. We have to make the random effects assumptions that we've already discussed. Um, and our estimates, our post-stratification estimates, are only going to be as good as those assumptions are. So it's worth asking um, when this is a smart thing to do. And that's where we're going to get into um, the bias variance trade-off in choosing between fixed effects and random effects, which is uh, next up on the docket. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the conditions under which uh, using a hierarchical linear model, um, or even more basically a random effects model, um, is a good idea relative to using a fixed effects model. Um, as we discussed in the past, uh, a fixed effects model um, corrects the bias that exists um, from omitting a relevant variable, that is to say the unit um, in a regression. But there are some times when, as you know, omitting variables is harmless to bias, specifically um, when that omitted variable is not correlated with the regressors that you really care about. So the, the short answer here is that it's OK to use a random effects model whenever um, x is not correlated with the unit effect. Um, however, this advice, uh, the advice that comes in this form is not so helpful. Uh, the reason is, uh, in practical application, x is almost always correlated, at least a little bit, um, with uh, the unit effect. And so random effects models and hierarchical linear models are very likely, in most cases, to have some degree of bias in them. Um, the question is whether the bias outweighs um, the variance increase that you get from using a fixed effects model. Uh, what I mean by that is the following. Um, it could be the case that, uh, you know, here's my estimate of, here's a couple of beta coefficients, beta 1 and beta 2. It could be the case that my fixed effects model is unbiased but has a great deal of variance. Whereas my random effects estimator or a hierarchical linear model is biased but has very, very narrow variance. On average, I might actually prefer to use the, the, the random effects model over the fixed effects model because um, my, basically my distance to the true point in the random effects model is reasonably fixed where I, and, and could be you know, fairly small, whereas my distance to the true point for a fixed effects model is much more variable. Could be small, like I could get this point here and be very close to the, uh, the true um, value of beta 2 and beta 1. But I could also be out here and be very far away. So on average, the answers that fixed effects models might give might be right, but they're just so variable that they're not quite as useful. So one way of um, trying to, to tackle this is to um, use simulation to figure out when it's a good idea um, to, to use a fixed effects model versus a random effects model. So what I've done here is created a data set. Um, you can see set C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This just ensures that we get the same answers. I'm setting an N of 20 and a T of 20. So this is a time series cross-section data set with 20 observations per unit and 20 units. And I'm going to just create some storage matrices here. And here's where the real fun happens. So let me get, oh, not that. Let me get this out of the way. So you can see that what I'm going to do is a thousand times I'm going to um, draw a data set uh, by first picking unit effects from the interval from negative 2 to 2. Uh, then I'm going to draw k or uh, t many observations per unit. Um, and I'm going to correlate the regressor x with the unit effect. So unit effect tells me what basically the intercept shift is. This is an intercept shift model only. You can see that when I create y down here. y is 1 plus a quarter x plus the unit effect plus a normally distributed error term. This unit effect is just an additive intercept shift. So what I'm going to do is draw x from the normal distribution with the mean at the unit effect. So that correlates x with um, unit heterogeneity. I'm just going to create y using a simple random intercept model. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate a two models, a fixed effects model and a random effects model. Here's the fixed effects model right here. You can see I'm estimating y as a function of x plus as factor unit. As factor says 
This unit variable, you can see I'm creating it up here, just says a number from one to 20, giving exactly what unit this is. Like a, it could be a state name in real data. It could be a country name in international relations data. Uh, the random effects model is the same model we ran last week, but I'm running it using a little bit different package. I'm using it using the LMER um, command in the ARM, A-R-M package. You can see it right up here. Um, this implements some functions out of um, Gelman and Hill's uh, book and was programmed by Gelman and Hill. And LMER um, just allows me to estimate this random effects model. And you can see I'm saying that uh, the model is just a linear model relating y to x plus one contingent on units. So in parentheses, there's one pipe unit. That just says that one is the constant, and the constant that we estimate for this model will be different for each unit. It will be a random effect on unit. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to recover the um, coefficients for um, x out of these two models. And confusingly, for the HLM model, you actually recover it using fix f. As I told you, fixed effects in a hierarchical linear model context just means the parameters estimated that don't vary from unit to unit. In that case, this is just the beta estimates um, for x. I'm also going to recover the coefficients for the fixed effects model. And finally, I'm going to save the standard errors that are estimated for each of these two models. So I'm going to get estimates of beta and the standard error. So uh, this takes a little bit to run, so I'm going to pause the video, run this, and then show you what happens. Okay, so the model is uh, now completed. The simulation is now completed. You can see I've done it a thousand times. And if I plot x against the unit effect, you can see that I've induced a positive correlation between the unit effect and x. In particular, as uh, x gets larger, the unit effect gets larger. So they're positively correlated. Uh, now, let's do a box plot of the HLM value for... Um, Oh, hold on just a second. All right, so I've got a box plot here of the HLM estimates, a thousand of them that I simulated, and the fixed effects estimates, a thousand of them I simulated. All of my thousand estimates come out of the same model, which is one plus a quarter x plus the unit effect plus the normal distribution error, the normally distributed error. Um, but each is a different sample, so the, this is just a basically measure of sampling variation. The true coefficient is a quarter, or 0.25, and you can see I've, I've indicated that on the, on the box plot. The HLM estimates are biased upward, which makes sense because the unit effect is correlated with uh, positively with x, and we're omitting, in some ways, the unit effect. We're only treating it as a randomly distributed variable with mean 0. So um, the HLM is telling us the betas are, are bigger than they really are. The fixed effects model, on the other hand, is giving us the right answers. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the standard errors, this is a plot of the standard errors for HLM models and the fixed effects models. You can see that this is the standard error for beta x, um, and the standard error is considerably higher for fixed effects models. It's you know the standard error is centered on about 0.9 in the hierarchical linear model, and about mm, 0.15 for the fixed effects model. Um, that's a substantial increase. Uh, and what that translates to is a higher proportion of false negatives uh, in the uh, fixed effects case. You can see what I've done is added up the number of times in this model that um, the hierarchical linear model um, falsely rejected the null. So we know the null is, oh, sorry, uh, incorrectly accepted the null. That's what I meant to say. We know the null is false here. The coefficient is actually a quarter. So we're supposed to be rejecting the null. Um, 19 times the hierarchical linear model fails to do that. 319 times the fixed effects model fails to do that. Um, so that's a pretty inefficient uh, model. In the case of uh, fixed effects, we're getting 319 or 31.9% um, false negatives. Only 19 um, false negatives in the case of the hierarchical linear model. Of course, this also means that the size or the propensity to produce false positives for these models, for the HLM model, is also worse. So now I'm doing the same exact simulation again, but you can see I replaced the coefficient on x with zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this model where the null is true and figure out the proportion of the time that the hierarchical linear model rejects the null when the null is true. Okay. All right, so that simulation is now completed. You can see that the hierarchical linear model, and I've used a two-tailed test here looking for any significant rejections of the null hypothesis, 
Uh, we're rejecting the null 587 times out of 1,000, so <laughs> nearly 59% of the time. Uh, that's a terrible size. Um, whereas we're falsely rejecting the null in the fixed effects model about 5% of the time, 0.55 or 5.6% uh, of the time. That's exactly what it should be doing. So uh, in the hierarchical linear model, you're getting a narrower estimate of um, a biased effect. Whereas in the fixed effects model, you're getting an unbiased estimate, uh, uh, an unbiased estimator, but also a pretty, a, a fairly variable one. So for this particular situation, perhaps it's not the best idea to use fixed effects models. So you can see that um, we're getting kind of bad results. Um, but the, the answer can be different in different situations. And you would want to assess that by looking at, okay, um, what, you know, you just sort of ask the relevant question, how accurately am I estimating a beta coefficient or a y hat or whatever it is I'm interested in estimating, figuring out what's giving me the, giving me the best estimate um, of the thing I care about. And you can accomplish that with simulation. And the answer uh, can, can be different um, from case to case. Uh, so now what I want to do is uh, go back to my notes here, um, give you a couple of facts about um, hierarchical linear modeling, and then uh, a bunch, show you a bunch of examples. So um, hierarchical linear model estimates are a compromise between um, two other kinds of estimators. Um, the complete pooling estimator and the no pooling estimator. A complete pooling estimator is one where you just say, OK, I'm going to run y is a function of x beta done. You know, I'm going to estimate that model. Um, a no pooling estimator, so in other words, no treatment of the unit effects at all. A no pooling estimator is one where you say, OK, each unit, I'm going to say, say one to, you know, well, I'll do, I'll do I. Each unit gets its own separate estimator. So I'm going to add in the error terms here. Well, I'll just do that. Actually, I'll do it this way. Y hat is a function of X beta hat. In this case, every single estimator gets, every single unit gets its own estimator. So I is one to N, where N is the number of units. Um, so for unit specific um, intercepts, so in other words for uh, the no pooling estimator here where we're just saying only the intercepts vary by unit, this is the least squares dummy variable or fixed effects model. Um, if the intercepts and slopes vary, intercepts and slopes, this is equivalent to running a separate regression I spelled it wrong. Separate regression for each panel. So uh, hierarchical linear models interpolate between these two different kinds of findings. Um, in fact, for example, the betas that they estimate will be in between the two, literally. The y hats will also, in some sense, be in between the two. Uh, and in fact, how similar um, HLM is to one of these two estimators uh, is contingent on what the heterogeneity, uh, the structure of the heterogeneity looks like. Uh, so for example, uh, if um, unit heterogeneity is small, then HLM is pretty close to the uh, complete pooling estimator which is just a way of saying that if there's not a lot of unit heterogeneity, um, then it's the case that basically HLM is going to tell you that. There's not a lot of unit heterogeneity, and the betas are going to be pretty close to what would have happened if you just dumped them all in. Um, if unit heterogeneity is large, guess what? <laughs> HLM is uh, pretty close to the no pooling estimator. And it turns out that um, uh, HLM is most useful uh, for low to moderate levels of heterogeneity. The uh, point being that if you really have you know, n panels with n completely different data generating processes, 
probably it's just best to run n regressions. Whereas if you have n panels and they all have similar DGPs, but there's some heterogeneity, then HLM is going to be better at absorbing that. Uh, the idea, um, the basic reasoning for this is that um, HLM doesn't assume n many completely different and unrelated data generating processes. It assumes one DGP with some level of unit heterogeneity. So the closer that your data is to that basic framework, the better it does. And that tends to be better when the levels of unit heterogeneity are, are, are comparatively small. Um, the fewer the observations per unit, the closer the estimate for that unit is to the complete pooling estimator. Um, which is to say that if you've got, like, say, five states, you know, Virginia, and Georgia, and Wisconsin, and you've got, say, like, eight estimator, or eight, uh, so call this T. I've got eight data points for Georgia, or I'm for Virginia, um, you know, 53 for Georgia and 61 for Wisconsin. Then the um, Virginia estimate will be pretty close to the complete pooling estimate. So what we would have gotten if we dumped all of these in the same model and run a regression, the Virginia estimate's going to be pretty close to that. The Georgia and Wisconsin estimates are going to be more, more distinct. Uh, this is the idea, this is sometimes called um, borrowing strength. Um, uh, units that have a comparatively low number of observations and hence a great deal of uncertainty in their estimates borrow strength from the complete pooling or sort of all the data estimator um, to extract as much information from the data as possible. So in other words, we assume, in, in effect, if I don't know very much or only a little bit about a particular unit, it's probably pretty close to the, I'm going to assume that it's pretty close to the grand, uh, the grand average or the grand uh, complete pooling estimator or whatever it is I'm interested in. The more information I get on that unit, the more I'm able to differentiate it, the more finer grained I'm able to, the more finely grained I am able to differentiate, differentiate it from the complete pooling estimator. Um, and this is typically looked on as a, um, as a positive aspect of HLMs because they can help you, um, as long as the assumptions that go into them are reasonable, they can help you uh, knit together your data and uh, make the most of limited information about particular panels. All right, so that's the sort of theoretical what is an HLM, how does it work. Um, now let's uh, get down to actually estimating these things. We've already done this a little bit in the simulation, but now I'm going to really get to uh, get to it and, and do some real estimates on real data. So uh, let's open up R. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, use the same data that we used for lecture nine. This is um, state level data on a bunch of um, on murder rates, effectively, and things that might cause murder rates. I'm going to um, only look at the data between 1977. Um, actually 1978, my, my apologies, and uh, 2000. And I'm also going to eliminate the District of Columbia from the data set. So if I do a view of this data, this is what I've got. I've got state level data on a whole bunch of different things, white population, murder rates, execution rates, all kinds of things, um, from 1978 to 2000. That's what I'm looking at. I've got it for all 50 states, excluding the District of Columbia. Now, get rid of that. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to um, basically just do some data transformation. Um, I'm going to calculate per capita spending as opposed to um, aggregate spending for a bunch of things, um, welfare, police, education. I'm going to calculate the log of population instead of the raw population numbers. That's just to smooth out the um, very large numbers. Um, you know, California has many millions. Wyoming has 300, 400,000. So I want to kind of make those differences a little more manageable with the log transformation. And the same thing goes for per capita income. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is replicate the models from last uh, week's class. And I'm going to start off by replicating a simple random effects model um, relating murder murder rates per 100,000 to Christian adherence um, per, as a percentage of the population from 0 to 100, police per capita spending, education per spending per capita, log per capita income, log population, and this random effect. So you can see the parentheses, uh, the sub parentheses here tells Stata, or I'm sorry, tells R, that I'm going to um, estimate a random effect. The one on the left-hand side means it's going to be a constant, which means it's a ran varying intercept. And STFIPS, after the, the bar or the pipe or PIP or whatever it's called, tells, it, tells me that I want this constant to be different according to the state FIPS code, which is just a numerical um, indicator of state. 
Um, so if I do a summary of that model, which is right here, you can see that here are the fixed effects are the beta coefficients for the x variable. So for example, every one unit increase in Christian inheritance causes a four hundredths of a person fewer murders <laughs> per hundred thousand. Um, so if we multiplied this by 100, it would be four fewer murders per thousand. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm, no. No, that's not that's not right. So it would be. Yeah, f yeah, four yeah four fewer. No, no. It would be, that's, mm, think about that. So it would be four hundredths of a person per hundred thousand. So that's a pretty pretty small um, decrease, but statistically significant. Uh, police per capita spending is negatively and powerfully associated with murder rates. Um, every one unit increase in police per capita spending um, causes an 18 um, person per 100,000 drop in murder rates. Um, you may remember that we estimated this last time using the PLM package. And if I uh, just run that same model using the PLM package and then look at model RE PLM, you'll see that I'm going to get rid of this you'll see that the coefficients are actually slightly different. For example, the police per capita spending in the LMER package is 18.77, whereas in the um, police per capita package, it's 19.55. Uh, that's because even though these are the same model, they're using slightly different um, techniques, numerical techniques, to find the, um, find the answers. And those numerical techniques don't always get exactly the same, um, same answer. But they are pretty close. Um, you can see that the coefficients, uh, actually there are some, looks like there are some big differences. Log population 0.55 versus negative 0.94, and they're both statistically significant. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. Looks like there are some pretty big differences. That's weird. Uh, anyway, um, the point being that these are, or at least they should be, fundamentally the uh, same model. Um, actually, hold on, let me try something real quick. Right, so you can see that this really is a function of the, the method by which the um, variance components in the random effects estimator are being, are being computed. Um, I've done two different models. I'm going to expand this out here. Um, one of them, I did the panel linear model um, with the default Swami Aurora transformation. You can see I get some coefficients here. Um, if I change that random method to the Amamiya transformation, I get very different coefficients, even though this is allegedly the same model. I could even translate this to something. Uh, maybe I could, if I uh, grab this here and change it to something like the NERLA of estimates. And then summary model.re.plm. Oh, look at that. Completely different estimates. <laughs> so. Uh, it looks like the, this this uh, particular model is actually quite sensitive to um, the way that we're computing the random effects. Um, one thing I do notice is that uh, the Swami Aurora, the Swami Aurora transformation seems to be much different than all the rest. Um, all the other ones seem to be putting a log population estimate of about 2.8, um, which is similar to the LMER estimate of let's see where are we here? Uh, right, uh, negative. It's at least in the same direction, negative 0.9, um, but it's pretty weird, I have to say, that there's such a big difference computationally. It makes me a little bit nervous about the um, about the validity of these estimates. Uh, nevertheless, we'll soldier on as though nothing is wrong um, in the proud tradition of all methodology. Um, so there are lots of differences in the in these estimators. They all operate according to different um, parameters. You can get slightly different estimates. I'm going to focus on the um, the LMER model since that's the uh, one that. Um, that's the one that involves the um, ARM package that we're focusing on for hierarchical linear models. So if you want to extract the coefficients um, for all the states out of an LMER model, you can use this coef model.re.lmer. And what it'll show you is exactly how, and I'm going to move this over a bit so you can see more, um, exactly how all these states are different from each other. And the w model we've specified uh, is set up in such a way that only the intercept is different for each state. You can see the intercept is estimated differently for each state, whereas all of the um, other the coefficients on x on the x's are all the same, because we've set it up to be that way. This is what I meant by um, post stratification being an interesting process. You can now the model is telling you exactly 
how these states are different in terms of their murder rates. So Alabama's murder rate, for example, is considerably higher than uh, Delaware's, but lower than uh, about the same as Florida's and lower than Georgia's. Um, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, if you want to see the averaged over all states equation, you can use FixF, but this is, tells you the average data generating process. Um, FixF is the average data, data generating process over all the units, and we can get standard errors on those by se.fixf. So those are the standard errors um, on average over all the states. If you want to see how much the intercept shifts away for each state, you can use RANF. This is how different um, each state is compared to the grand state average. So Alabama has about four more murders than average per 100,000. Um, Hawaii has about four fewer than average. And we can get standard errors on, on that as well, like so. The standard errors are all, are all the same in this case because the sample sizes are all the same for each state. Now, uh, here's a bit of code. I don't want to belabor this too much because there's, I mean, a lot of coding stuff that you can look over on your own time. But what I'm going to do is make a confidence interval plot of the intercepts, which means I'm going to need to uh, let's move this over again so I can do a nice plot. Um, this confidence interval plot, what I'm going to do is set the mean equal to the random effect um, for each of the states. And I'm going to calculate the standard deviation um, is just the standard error of the random effects. Then I'm going to create an error bar plot. That error bar thing is in um, the hmisc package. And what this is going to allow me to do is plot the difference between each state and the grand country level average, or the United States average, in murder rate for each state. And what you can see is um, the standard errors are quite narrow because we have a lot of data for each state. And moreover, uh, they're all the same standard errors. If you zoomed in more, you could see that. But now I've got a real nice visual depiction of, oh, OK, you know, Maine has got a lower murder rate, Iowa, uh, Idaho, Hawaii, Delaware. It looks like rich Midwestern and Southern states, or I'm sorry, rich Midwestern. Um, and uh, Hawaii is like a far, west, far Western state. Um, Vermont, so the Northeast seems to be implicated here, South Dakota, North Dakota, New Hampshire. Low population states. Um, are sort of uh, are in here too. They're getting lower um, intercepts, whereas Texas, New York, Nevada, California, Illinois, Louisiana, Southern and large population states. Even though we have population as a variable, that's what seems to be indicating bigger than uh, bigger uh, errors than average. Um, you would see differences in the error bars if we. Um, had different numbers of observations in each um, state. So what I'm going to do is um, just create a random selector variable and drop, um, f I think, 35% of the data, and then re-estimate this whole thing. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to belabor this. Just rerun this whole thing, having dropped randomly 35% um, of the data. You can see I re have reported here how many observations I now have in each state. So some have 10, some have 9, some have uh, 7, some have 6. And you can see that comes out in the error bars now being different. The, error bar, uh, the greater the um, number of observations that a state has, the narrower its error bars are, like Iowa has 11. You can see Iowa is pretty closely estimated here. Um, Alabama only has 6. Alabama has a wider confidence interval. So the model will only will tell you, oh, I'm less certain about Alabama's position if I have less information about Alabama, which is... Uh, exactly what you would want it to do, I think. Now suppose I wanted to run a hierarchical model. So what I'm going to do is do a hierarchical model where I first have different regional intercepts and then I have different state level intercepts. So I'm going to create a region variable. This data, dot re data dollar sign region um, is just the region variable I already had except as a factor, um, which is a, a variable format that data that I'm sorry that state can understand for this ex uh, particular example. Uh, so I'm just going to do that real quick. Uh, then, uh, here, oh, here's what the levels of that factor variable look like. Mm. Have I attached data? Hold on a second. There we go. I had a small error there. Uh, so I'm going to, hold on, I'm going to actually detach the data set. Uh, is that detached? Yeah. And then I'm going to reattach this data. Here we go. So there are the levels that are in the region variable, Midwest, Mountain West, Northeast, Pacific, and South. And now I'm going to run a new model where 
region and um, state FIPS code are both random effects on the constant. So this is a hierarchical model. State FIPS is nested inside of region. You can see that um, the random effects are, are up here in the, in the printout. And you can see that state FIPS is listed above region. Here are the fixed effects. Uh, and as you can see, um, coefficients are a bit different than we had before, um, but basically the same. Um, log population has a negative effect on murder rate. That's kind of weird. I would expect population to have a positive effect on murder rate. Um, per capita income has a positive effect on murder rate. Again, I would expect it to have the opposite. Um, so maybe some weird stuff going on here, but nevertheless, we'll proceed. Uh, I'm going to store the random effects um, for region and state, and then plot these things out for you using that error bar command. And then I'm going to plot the region effects right next to it. Actually, this might look a bit better if I hide my face for a moment. There we go. So um, you can see what's happened here is that um, we now have pretty good estimates of both region and state level effects. Uh, the regional effects are, are a little bit, um, none of them are actually statistically distinguishable from zero. So it may be that we don't need region effects here. Um, the state effects are distinguishable from zero. Um, and we're seeing similar patterns to that we saw last time. Louisiana has a strong positive uh, error on um, murder rate, Illinois, um, California, Texas, New York, and so on. Um, other things have a strong negative association with murder rate. Um, so the final thing I want to do, given that there are some issues remaining here, is uh, maybe try to um, look at whether the effect of education per capita spending um, varies according to state. We can start playing playing with different kinds of um, varying intercept or varying slope and intercept models. And you can see here is what I've done is I've just dropped the region variable and I've now um, had my random effect as 1 plus ed spend PC, which is uh, by state FIPS, which is going to allow the intercept to vary according to state FIPS code. And you can see that ed spend PC is now in the random effects. It's still in the fixed effects too. That's the average impact of, of um, education spending on average in all the states. One unit increase in education spending per capita causes about a quarter or fewer murders per 100,000. Um, the intercepts are also um, different for each state. So let's plot all the slopes for different states the way we plotted the intercepts before. So what I'm doing now is just plotting a bunch of slopes. This is all the slopes for education spending by, state by state. And what you can see is that in Florida, for example, education spending has a very strong negative relationship with um, with murder rates, which kind of makes sense given the fact that if you uh, Georgia as well, uh, California has a little less so. Alaska has a strong negative effect. Texas, Nevada, the places that have strong negative effects, Wyoming, seem to be places that have low education spending to begin with. So they're at the bottom of a declining marginal effects curve, where initial increases in spending cause big, big positive um, uh, uh, outcomes. So in other words, a little bit more education spending in these states would cause a big difference in terms of their um, ed, their outcomes. Uh, whereas Kansas, uh, Connecticut, uh, there aren't a lot of big positive relationship states, Wisconsin maybe, um, but a lot of zeros and slightly maybe positive effects. These are states that already spend a lot on education. Uh, Wisconsin spends a lot on education. Uh, Connecticut spends a lot on education. So these are states that are at the top of that marginally declining effects curve where their education spending is probably not going to reduce murder. Um, maybe in some crazy way it will even increase it um, uh, simply because um, th that money spent on education could be spent on cops. Uh, finally, and just, as, just more of as an example than anything, I want to show you a case where we can make the intercept and, and slope coefficients um, that are random, not correlated with each other. Um, and what, what I've done here, you can see what I've done is I've just had a, uh, I have a constant being predicted by state FIPS. Then I have zero plus ed, pen, ed spend PC also separately being predicted by state FIPS. This causes those two effects to be non-correlated with each other. Um, and the difference between that model and the model we ran before is, uh, well, it's there. You can see education spending has a positive effect um, in, in this model that assumes that education spending and the intercept are not correlated, where it has a negative effect there. That's kind of weird. 
Um, in fact, I would probably go so far as to say that if you saw this, I would say, well, probably um, I have good theoretical reasons to expect that um, high murder states also have low education spending because they're spending all their money on cops or not spending their money on anything. Maybe they have low taxes. Um, so given that I have a theoretical reason to believe they're correlated and given that this result where they're not correlated is so weird, I probably would want to default to um, the correlated model. Uh, we could test that by looking at the AIC or, or the BIC. So the BIC is 4192. Here the BIC is 4222, so it's bigger. So this is saying that the uncorrelated model is not as good uh, as the correlated model. So 4142, 4177, the AIC says the same thing. We should go with the correlated model. So we can use those model comparison tests we talked about to sort of adjudicate among them. And um, though both of those tests seem to prefer the model where um, education spending's varying slope is correlated with the varying intercept. All right, so uh, there's your crash course in hierarchical linear models. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, just to sort of say, say something I already said last week, uh, a panel and TSES data is something you can spend a long time learning how to deal with. Um, these two lectures are only the, the slightest scratch of the surface. There's so much more that um, I, I just you know didn't tell you, didn't have time to tell you. That's why we um, most programs, including ours, offer a full course in longitudinal or panel data analysis. And I, I really encourage you to take it. I encourage you to take it. Um, this is designed to be a, a nice primer that makes you good enough to be dangerous for initial analyses. Um, and also maybe whet your appetite for all the complexities um, that can exist in panel and time series data. If you listen to this lecture and had a lot of questions, um, had a lot of doubts about is what he's doing makes sense, why is this crazy thing happening, what about this um, source of heterogeneity he's not talking about, chances are all of those critiques are good ones um, and they've uh, maybe, maybe not been dealt with in the literature. Um, this is why there's a whole, actually there are many classes one could offer, but um, this is why in most programs there is a whole class on it. So I, I really hope, uh, hope that you find some time to take it. Uh, and uh, if I'm teaching it, I hope to see you there. Anyway, see you next week.